Okay, so we're at uh, trying to figure out a little bit, uh, as we've said, a definition of a plasma is uh, quasi-neutral gas, uh, got charged and mostly charged, but some neutral particles. And we want, we're interested in the situation where the particle interactions are predominantly collective. That is to say, not just two-body interactions, as in a neutral gas, where you go in straight lines, have a two-body interaction, another straight line, and so forth. But rather, the situation where as any one charged particle moves along, it seems to have a collective interaction with many other particles uh, simultaneously. So fundamentally, uh, the question is, um, uh, well, the, the questions then that we might say uh, for this having to do with the uh, collective interactions is, um, and that's what the questions of plasma physics are, that's, well, uh, how does one describe uh, s such a medium, uh, collective interaction medium? It's the collective interaction, by the way, which is often used to mean plasma physics when you talk about quark gluon plasmas or something like that. Um, you know, fluid, kinetic theory, uh, uh, you know, when it's not just two particle uh, um, effects. And a second one is, uh, really, you know, this picture gives you the feeling that, gosh, you know, the potential falls off like 1 over R. The electric field, force field, falls off like 1 over R squared. That's not exponential or anything like that. I could have particles separated by you know, hundreds of meters, miles, they still got some interaction, right? And that, that kind of doesn't sound right, if you know what I mean by that. So the kind of question you get into is, uh, do charged particles really have infinite interaction distances? Doesn't seem physically right, you know, two particles 10 miles apart, two charged particles having just a little bit of a weak interaction, you know, doesn't, doesn't sound quite right. Well, it turns out it's, the answer is no. Uh, it's limited, and, and this is what we'll do the mathematics of, uh, by the polarizing uh, effects of a charged particle on all the other charged particles. And this will lead to something which is called the Debye length, which is the collective interaction distance. And so um, that's, uh, that's the name. And, and it turns out that we won't have interactions longer than that Debye length. So that's what we uh, next want to uh, go on and derive here is, the, um, is the, that collective uh, interaction. So... Basically, what we would then like to do is, uh, is basically to calculate the potential um, around a charged particle, around a, a given charged particle. And we will call that particle a test particle. So our physical idea is, yes, we have all of these charged particles that are going to be moving around and everything else, a whole bunch of plus minuses and so forth and so on. But I'm going to pick out one particular one, and I'm going to call that the test particle. Okay, so we have, um, so let's see, let me draw some pluses over here. And, you know, and, uh, and then we'll have a bunch of minuses, hopefully about the same number, make it quasi-neutral. And I'm going to pick out that one, okay, star. This is my test particle. doesn't really matter which one it is. Uh, it's just one particle in the plasma. And it'll have uh, charge Q, oops, charge Q, uh, uh, and it'll just be sitting there. Okay. Now, how would I obtain the potential or electric field around that charged particle? Well, 
first off, we're going to assume everything's kind of slow moving and there's no real problems. So assume electrostatics, it turns out. And that means that the electric field will be derivable from a potential and will be just given by E is equal to minus grad phi. Second thing is to determine the potential around that charge. We should, uh, uh, we should consider Gauss's law or Poisson's equation. And that is that the divergence of the electric field is just given by now here's where we finally show our true colors and say yes we're MKS, namely it's rho over epsilon naught. Um, but the del dot E itself is just minus del squared phi if we plug in, you know, that the electric field is just minus grad phi. So all we need to know in order to determine the potential around that charge that given charged particle is the charge density. Well, what is the charge density going to be due to? Well, it, that's meant to be a goof up. Anyway, uh, the charge density is going to be two things. One is it's going to be this given test particle. Okay, it, that test particle is a charge. Okay, so. Um, the first part is the uh, test charge, and we will make that. Um, we will say that that is uh, composed of Q test. I guess I was going to make this a Q sub T, make it a Q test. Uh, and we're going to make it a stationary charge. We don't want to worry about things moving for a moment. And it's uh, some delta function. You know, it's going to be a point charge. Uh, by the way, is it really a point charge? Not really. There's quantum mechanical effects in at the Fermi radius of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, but we're going to be a lot longer than that. We're going to be, uh, you know, sort of a lot longer distances than that. So it's a point charge as far as we're concerned. Okay, so, um, but we're going to have the test charge, but now because I have this test charge here, and because it creates some potential. That potential will actually jiggle or move all the rest of the charged particles. The presence of the one charged particle will cause a polarization of the rest of the medium. Okay? So um, there will be a polarization charge. Which I'm going to call delta rho, let's see what I call it, uh, polarization due to the phi uh, in the plasma, or the electric field, but anyway. So the idea is that we're going to have two sources of charge in the plasma, namely the test charge and how it's going to interact directly with one particle, but in fact the whole rest of the medium, you know, that'll create a potential. The fact that I have a potential electric field will then slightly polarize the rest of the medium, the rest of all the charges. So that's what we want to calculate. Oh, sorry. So the idea then is that the test charge part, you know, that's just a delta function part. That's no big deal. But what we'd like to now estimate is something having to do with the polarization. So how is the potential going to affect all the rest of these particles? In particular, imagine there's, you know, zillions of these particles. And they're more or less uniformly distributed in space because, remember, we wanted charge balance, charge causing neutrality. Well, what happens is there is a Gibbs distribution um, of particles, which formally in, uh, is F is e to the minus the Hamiltonian over kT. But for us, uh, just, you know, the density distribution function is approximately equal to some equilibrium amount times e to the minus, and the Hamiltonian is q phi uh, here. So we'll have minus uh, q phi over t. And already you see I'm dropping the kt, Moltzmann's constant, because again, I'm continuing to use ev instead of degrees Kelvin as my measure 
of energy or temperature. Okay. So um, with this in mind, now I, you know, any one particle. Remember, I'm, I'm, what I'm interested in here is the polarization. Okay, around that one particle. Any one particle is surely going to have an awfully small potential, right? So I, let's say I expand this as one and then minus q phi over t uh, plus higher order terms. Okay. So, in other words, to lowest order, the density is that that constant density. You know, I've got equal temperatures throughout, or a equal density distribution. But to higher order a little bit, I have this extra potential. Okay, a potential distortion. This is my polarization in truth. So this will give me then uh, a charge density, which will be, I'll have to sum, running out of time here a little bit, so I have to sum over the species the number of particles, nj, times qj, you know, times their individual charges. And this will be the sum over j of qj times n, times n not j times 1 minus qj phi over tj plus and so forth. Now, for quasi-neutrality, what we have to have is that the sum over j of n naught j qj had better be equal to 0. I better have approximately equal numbers of plus and minus charges throughout the plasma. So that means that this one term goes away. Okay? And so what this charge density becomes then is really just the sum over j and not j uh, qj. Uh, actually, there's a q uh, squared in here and then a tj and then times phi. So if we now, we now then know, if we come back to here our polarization charge, uh, we then have that the polarization charge is equal to the sum over j of uh, n naught j uh, qj squared divided by tj uh, all times phi. That's what we had, had gotten. Uh, uh, I need a minus sign here. <laughs> Minus signs are a little bit critical in this business, and so I better put a minus sign in there. So um, we then put this together. Remember, what we were trying to do is calculate the potential around a charge, and what we find then is that our Poisson's equation, or Gauss's law with E equals minus grad phi, becomes minus del squared phi is rho over epsilon naught, and the rho was then the test charge we put in, which is a spatial position, you know, some x naught, some particular x naught. And then we also have minus the sum over species of n naught j, and we need to have over epsilon naught, uh, qj squared over tj times phi. And this is our polarization, and this is our test charge. Well, the key, and we're going to have an epsilon naught. The key to all this is that this is a phi and that is a phi. And so we end up defining this as the units, if you look at it, of some length. And so we define 1 over a Debye length squared. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm down here at the bottom too. <laughs> yeah, sorry. 1 over lambda Debye length is the sum over species, but I'll make it just n naught q squared over epsilon naught t. And then our equation, okay, if I put this over here, then becomes del squared minus 1 over the by length squared all times phi is equal to our test charge minus over epsilon naught times a delta function x minus x naught. This particular part here is very important. It's our so-called Debye shielding. If that wasn't there, I would just get the ordinary Coulomb potential around the test charge. If this wasn't there, if the test charge wasn't there, 
you can see that I would get a, a damping off of the potential around a charge, del squared minus 1 over lambda to by squared, over a distance of a Debye length. So what the sum of all this means, and then we'll have to discuss it in greater detail next time, is that the potential around a particle starts off falling off as 1 over r at short distances, namely Coulomb potential. But then, okay, it actually dies off because of this Debye shielding over some distance of this order of this collective interaction, polarization of the medium, Debye shielding. And so there is no substantial interaction outside of that Debye shielding length. Um, I'll finish by just writing down the, the sort of formal uh, solution of the equation. Namely, you'll find that phi of x is given by Q test over uh, epsilon naught 4 pi epsilon naught times the magnitude of x minus xi x0. The spatial, uh, this is just the Coulomb potential. Um, call that r, the distance away. And then there's e to the minus x minus x naught over the Debye length. So what happens is that these interactions take place not between individual particles, but they do so within some distance called the Debye length. And then they don't interact over longer distances because the, all, the, all the rest of the particles collectively move or are polarized and cause a Debye shielding on distances long compared to the Debye length. Next time we'll go and talk about what we'll, you know some typical Debye lengths, write them out a little bit, talk a little bit more about what we mean by this solution. And next time we'll start um, at 11.30, by the way, here, and then we'll get back on schedule.